They won Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet 'cause they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew, let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho, they're entertaining everyone. So who's gonna grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on stars in the. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Benanti coming to you from my attic. The glamour never ends, my friends. Oh gosh, I am very, very lyrically talented.、Um, how are you doing? I don't smell great. I'm really glad that this is not a scratch and sniff situation, but I do have an incredible show for you tonight. But first, I want to thank you all. For raising over seven hundred and fifteen thousand dollars thus far for the Actors Fund through Stars in the House, thank you, Seth and James. Thank you to everyone who is watching and has contributed and participated. I genuinely do not know what theater artists would do without you. So thank you. I just want to say very briefly. I don't know if you saw recently the New York Times released an article about artists losing our health insurance. Um, so last year, the Actors Fund released the Every Artist Insured campaign to help folks at the six month and the year marks. They also have free dedicated health insurance、um, workshops every year for free. Every excuse me, every week for free, not every year, every week for free, including one on one counseling. And you can visit the Actors Fund website to register. So I just wanted to throw that out there.、Um, my first guest. Is a very dear friend of mine. She is a Tony Award-winning actress, but beyond that, and mom, and wife, an incredible human, and also she is probably one of the most dedicated activists that I have ever known.、Um, whether it's for Planned Parenthood, social justice, and political reform, and most recently through her organization co-founded with Rory O'Malley, Stacey's Drama Club.、Um, Um, in fact, she was the recipient of the very first ACLU Michael Friedman Award for living a life and pursuing a career dedicated to social justice. Please give a warm welcome to Celia Keenan Bolger. Hi. <laughs> Just two tired, two tired moms at eight o'clock. Eight o'clock is now my bedtime. <laughs> like I'm done by eight o'clock. Ooh. I've played so many characters when you're like, at eight o'clock. Yeah, where I'm just like, <laughs> I just get in my coffin and I close the lid.、Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show. Before we delve into all of your social justice work, I want to first talk about your podcast. Oh, this is、um, the first time I'm talking about it.、I、you have、know. inside information. Heard it here first, folks. Breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> That's the banner. The the breaking news banner. The ticker tape. Ticker ticker ticker. Exactly.、Mm -hmm. So it's called Sunday Pancakes with Celia Keenan Bolger, right?、Mm -hmm. Yes. Podcast、mm -hmm. to nourish your head and your heart. My head and my heart need nourishing. My、oh, body. Same, Laura. Same. <laughs> I feel like inside <laughs> of this pandemic, I was just like, what? Do I do、mm -hmm. if I don't have a job?、Yeah. Like if there's no acting work to be had, and I, I think what I realized is the thing that I miss the most about work is being with other people. Like no joke, just like connecting with people, talking about、mm -hmm. our lives or the work that we're doing. And I feel like when that was taken away this past year, I was like, what? Am I? I'm so starved for human connection, and I was like, "What could I do? I could make a podcast, and I could make people talk to me." And so that's what I did. And it's not. It's. it's okay. I was like, "I'm just going to try to、um, call some friends and have some conversations." And it's really mostly it's like a theater podcast about how we're all doing. That's essentially like trying to have the conversations to just say like, "How are you taking care of yourselves? What are you finding really great? What are you finding?" Really difficult, and it's、mm -hmm. been so helpful to me to just be able to talk to people. And I think because we've been so isolated, there actually is so so much sameness to this terrible、mm -hmm. thing that we've gone through. But that we, because we have to stay away from one another, the shared experience of that hard, terrible thing that we are all experiencing、mm -hmm. is is not shared. 
Mm. And so it sort of has given me a place to um, to feel a little bit less alone. How many guests have you had so far? How many have you recorded? I've recorded four. Okay. Um, Can you tell us who? So yeah, um, um, Danae Benton, oh. um, Kelly O'Hara. Amazing. Sarah Bareilles. Oh. And Philippa Sue. We're doing a we're doing a, an all ladies start I for International it. Women's Month. Um, there will be men on the podcast at some point when I when I when I make a decision to talk to a guy. Sure. I mean, it's your podcast. Yeah. You do what you want to do. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. Um, um, that's amazing. And what do you feel like is the overwhelming like um, response? Like, is there a is there a through line that you're hearing in most of these interviews? Is there a common? I mean, it's interesting. I think there is. Us, the, the theme that really keeps coming up is why did it take a global pandemic for me to lie down? Mm. And that's like for myself and others. Mm -hmm. And just sort of what our, how much our self-worth is wrapped up in the work that we do. Mm -hmm. How much I think we all feel like we became so much more politically activated and that that if the events of, with George Floyd being murdered, if if we had all been in regular times, mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't have felt like we would have been able to absorb that in the way that we did. And that, what that has sort of brought up for, for everybody and how we're trying to go forward mm -hmm. responsibly. And, um, and so it's been, I feel like it's it's interesting because everybody, you know, people have different backgrounds. Some people have kids, some people don't. Mm -hmm. um, and but really, the over, I mean, I think the the big the big takeaway for me is that everyone was just like, I I didn't realize how much I needed a reset, and also mm -hmm. how difficult it is to reset. Like we're just mm -hmm. not really wired to be like, and now I'm gonna um let myself rest mm -hmm. and that will actually also be an act of resistance or an act of just trying to take care of myself and that mm -hmm. is very very difficult to do that mm -hmm. and also the incredible privilege that accompanies that being your pandemic experience as opposed to being Correct. a worker on the front line or someone who you know has to go to work you know, in a grocery store. And, you know, I, I think I can only speak for myself when I say like balancing that too, like saying to myself, I feel really guilty for lying down because I'm able to lie down, you know? Um, yes. So I'm interested to hear people's takes on that as well. Mm -hmm. Um. So I can't, when can we hear it and where can we hear it? Well, you, it's gonna, it's being produced by Playbill, but you'll be able to find nice. it wherever you find your podcast, Apple Podcast or Spotify, wherever, Stitcher, is that still a thing? Yeah. Um, but, and it should, I think we're, we're probably, it's, it's, I think at some point in March, um, I don't okay. know that we have a hard hmm. timeline at this point, but it's, yeah, it's, it's March, right? Is it March now? That's right. Okay. It is right. March. Um, just barely, so just barely. It is, and I think the truth is, I would, I don't know that I would have ever done this if I hadn't mm -hmm. felt like there's, I, you know, I really like being an actor. And yeah. I was like, I, the side project is always something that I'm like, that would be a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In what time? Doing? And so, you know, it was sort of born out of this need for connection. And, and I think also I heard this amazing George Saunders interview at the beginning of the pandemic. And he was like, you know what? It's an artist's job to document the time because nobody is gonna believe what we just went through. Like in 70 years, people will be like, wait, what? Yeah. Like everything shut down? And the, he was just like, it's really, we don't have to process it. We don't have to do anything. We just have to document it. And yeah. I was like, this at least will maybe give a little insight into what this was. I don't know. Yeah. I love that. I love that um, view on it. And it really is true. I, I do think back to so many challenging times in our history and the incredible art that has come out of it mm -hmm. um, and how that did. Not that much out. art from people with children, but yes, a lot of Excellent. really good. <laughs> Excellent point. Very good point. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you. So, okay. Wow. That's really, you're right. That really got me. 
just now what you said. <laughs> um, so now you're also filming Gilded Age for HBO Max. Yes. Which I'm yes. very, very excited to see. And I am also very excited. Before we were live, um, you were saying how a four, shooting a 14 hour day felt somehow easier than being a mother during a pandemic. And I, I, will, I stand by it 100. More. So do I. So do I. I, were, I worked for three weeks. I've never worked for three weeks on a television show in my life, like straight, yeah. like all day, every scene yes. we're block shooting because of COVID. Right. And so I was just like doing it every day. Yeah. And then got back yesterday and I was like, mm -hmm. why am I so tired? So, yeah. so, so tired. Yeah. It is. I wish there was is. a better phrase than stay at home moms. I've, to me, that's somehow mm -hmm. implies that they're just like home, like eating bonbons and just like <laughs> chilling because I'm like, that is the actual hardest job on the face of the earth, at least for me. Like, mm -hmm. I, I find it so challenging to, so shout out to whatever the better phrase is for stay at home moms. Yeah, like, right. Hero moms. Yeah, <laughs> like that's, what, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Okay, so so I want to move on. Better tape. Ticket to hero moms. Stay at home moms. moms. <laughs> now referred to as hero moms. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Stacy's Drama Club. Mm -hmm. um, and Something else born out of the pandemic. Thank you so much for raising all of that money for Georgia. I, on behalf of um, humanity and our democracy, I want to thank you, <laughs> tip my hat to you. Um, and, oh my gosh, I can't believe how quickly this time is going. What, so what do you, can you just explain briefly what Stacy's Drama Club is before we bring on Jeffrey? Yes, it was basically just a way to try to get the theater community. I feel like what I have learned, and I, it's funny, even when you were like, she's an activist, I was like, I don't even know if I'm an activist. I think I'm an organizer. That I'm just oh. like, if you, I'll, I'll give you a place to go. And I know that the theater community shows up all the time whenever I'm like, you want to come do this? And mm -hmm. so I basically was like, let's raise money for Georgia. And I called Rory O'Malley and he was like, let's get it going. He came up with Stacy's Drama Club based on Stacey Abrams. And um, we were like, and we just coordinated an effort with the theater community. And after it was done, we had this huge list of people who were willing to volunteer. And I was like, I think the next thing that we should do is New York City local politics because our city is in such a really pivotal, pivotal moment. And so as I was starting to think about like, who would we support? It became very clear that Jeffrey Amora was my candidate and should be Stacey's Drama Club's next candidate that we sort of threw our support behind because he is basically running as an arts and culture candidate. He, mm. I first met him, he was an actor's equity counselor and he basically organized with the other Fairway John stage, stage people, like one of the greatest, um, income raises in all of like union like union history mm. but he also just the way that he talked about the value of artists and the way um that we view ourselves i just found him extremely um smart and also compelling and then he, he was like oh yeah i'm also running for city council and i was like there it is that's my guy mm -hmm. and so i like got to talk to him a little bit and I don't live on the Upper West Side. He's in. He's running in District Six, mm -hmm. and so um, so if you live in District Six, y'all get mm -hmm. get it going with Jeffrey Amora. But you can still um, volunteer right now. There's a lot of petitioning going on because in order to be on the ballot in the primary, you have to have. I'm not. I can't remember how many signatures. It's a lot, but and you have to try to get more than however many is asked for. So mm. they're in the process of doing that right now. He's done an amazing job of running, um, of raising money, and his whole campaign is run by all of these equity counselors that he ran with. And so they have this amazing, not only just like this machine that really like knows how to work, but I think they speak the same language and mm -hmm. they're dedicated to labor, they're dedicated to housing, they're dedicated to healthcare, like things that obviously really affect artists, but also mm -hmm. really affect small business is another one that he is really um, big on. And so mm -hmm. just listening to him talk, and he's also, he'll talk about it, I'm sure. Well, I'll let him talk about it and just say like, he really, I was so moved that someone from our community would like look and see a space and say, I could fill that space. And mm -hmm. if he's elected, he'll be the first Japanese American openly gay um, city council member for New York City. So like, mm -hmm. there's just a lot to it that feels really um, moving, but also really inspiring. So mm -hmm. I feel, I feel really, um, 
I feel lucky to to put his name out there and to be in any way associated with his campaign. That's amazing. And with all of that, let's please welcome Jeffrey to the show. Hello. Hi, How Jeffrey. Are Hi. How are you? Laura, it's so great to meet you. And Celia, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Come on. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's been um, it's been a wild you know, few months. We we announced the campaign in November. <laughs> And uh, you know, I didn't know what what to expect. This is my first time running for public office, but uh, the the arts community has really rallied behind this campaign. Um, like like Celia mentioned, uh, we we did a, a pretty good job with the fundraising. We received more individual donations than any other campaign in Manhattan in the most oh. recent filing period, and that was because the because of the arts community, mm-hmm. and and almost thirty percent of the donations that we received came from people who listed their occupation as unemployed. Oof. And so I think I think that means that the message is resonating, that the arts and culture sector needs a champion. So that's mm-hmm. why that's why I'm in this. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, so what makes an actor, a Carnegie Mellon trained actor, decide to run for public office? Was there a was there a series of events that happened or was there one sort of aha moment? Yeah, you know, if, if you'd asked me a year ago, I, I did not think I'd be running for city council right now. A year ago, uh, you did not think that? No, 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 a year ago. Well, a year ago, I was sitting in uh, at the Metropolitan Opera across the street from where I live mm-hmm. in the final performance that the, that the opera gave not knowing that the next day the Met and all of Broadway would shut down. Yes. And I've, I've been uh, a member of Equities Council for the last four years now. And you know we've, we've been able to make some really great progress. We mm-hmm. launched Equities First Strike in 50 years and got profit participation back into the Broadway show development agreement, um, getting you know, just better wages, better working conditions and more job opportunities for you know everyone across the country. And then the pandemic hit and it shut down all of our employers and suddenly all of our members were unemployed and it wasn't just us it was everybody who works backstage in front of house and the arts administrators and this past summer we realized that help wasn't coming for us we were getting left out of the conversation at every level of government at the time the uh, the u.s senate was negotiating the heroes act and it, it looked like the arts was going to get completely left out. So we scrambled and started organizing and we created the Be an Arts Hero campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we organized the national arts community to collectively lobby Congress for direct arts relief. And we sat down with over 60 U.S. Senate offices. And in the most recent stimulus package that was passed in December, we got $15 billion in direct arts relief. So that was a huge step. It saves, you know, that was part of the Save Our Stages yes. uh, program. Mm-hmm. So it, it saves the stages, but now we've got to now we've got to make sure that all the arts workers survive. Yes, <laughs> all of us. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, you know, I, I had been lobbying city council for arts funding on behalf of off Broadway theater companies. You know, some of them are, are huge institutions, and some of them are tiny, where every single dollar counts. And it's you know, for them, it's it's really hard to pay uh, anything close to a living wage. Mm-hmm. So, we decided to to team up with the artistic directors of these off Broadway theater companies and go to city council together, and and right. get more funding. Mm-hmm. That's how I got to know all the arts advocates on the city council, and we have some really great ones. The problem is they're all term limited, mm-hmm. and we've got this election this summer, and and after after everyone votes, two thirds of the city council is term limited. We, we've got fifty one seats, thirty five I think are are term limited. So we're going to have a, a brand new government, and there may be no one left in that government to advocate for the arts community at a time when we need it most. Yes. And you know, Broadway's going to come back. Mm-hmm. It's going to reopen at some point, but we don't know what it's gonna look like. Mm-mm. We don't know how, we don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, it's certainly not going to come roaring back at the, you know, the record-breaking 2019 numbers that we had. Right. But it's going to come back. And, it's, yeah. and we're going to need allies and advocates in the city government to make sure that our industry has all of the support that it needs um, and, and to make sure that audiences come back, 
that, you know, 70% of, of Broadway audiences are tourists. Yes. So what's the city's plan to make sure that all of those tourists come back into the city so that we can, we can all get back to work. Right. It's not as simple as just like everybody wear your mask and get your vaccine and then it's going to be fine. Right. And no. just, you know, just last also... week. No, no, go. Oh, I was just saying that just last week, um, you know, Governor Cuomo announced that venues would be able to to open their doors and everyone got really excited and they're like, oh, well, maybe that means Broadway's coming back. And, you know, I, I, I talked to some Broadway producers and they're like, we can't operate at a third capacity. No. And even if, even if we could, we, you know, we still have to keep the performers safe. Yes. So until, until everyone's vaccinated, it's, it's really tricky, uh, you know, figuring out how to, um, how to reopen a, a business like Broadway. Yeah. I mean, especially if, you know, 80% is herd immunity and 25% of our population is kids who can't be vaccinated as of right now. And then not to mention the people who refuse to be vaccinated. Um, it's it's going to take a minute for us to get there. But Sales, what were you going to say? Just that I loved so much that you also had worked on behalf of off-Broadway theaters, because I think sometimes mm -hmm. it's easy to feel like, you know, we have to get Broadway back. We have to get Broadway back when the truth is like the best theater that I see in the city mm -hmm. is usually off-Broadway or yeah. in some other. And that this idea that there will be somebody who is knowledgeable, not just about like economy and, you know, we have to get the dollars back in, and like Broadway, Broadway, but that you have this nuanced take on what not just arts and culture but specifically inside of the theater and i think i've i've talked about this before with jeffrey that i just feel like we are in this moment in history that feels like repair and reconciliation is like of paramount importance and i don't know where else that happens it doesn't happen mm -hmm. on social media it doesn't happen through journalism it's like arts and culture stories are the only way towards empathy, I think towards mm -hmm. seeing one another mm -hmm. more clearly or at least understanding one another. And like, mm -hmm. if we don't put so much money into our arts and culture, I don't know what that means for our fractured country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, it, everyone keeps saying, you know, we need to, um, we need to get back to normal. And it's, you know, that's not, that's not good enough. <laughs> The status quo was not working for nearly enough of us. Mm -hmm. And so as we as we reopen the arts economy, we've got to figure out how do we make it more inclusive? Um, mm -hmm. So if, if if I win this election, you know, New York City has the largest arts budget in the country. It's larger than the, the United States arts budget. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a huge responsibility um, deciding where where that money is going, how how do we allocate those funds? Mm -hmm. and we've got to make sure that it includes all of the communities in all five boroughs that have historically been shut out of funding opportunities. Mm. This is so important that 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 the uh, the arts community we we create after this is better than what came before. Yes, I think that that's going to be a, a really big part of my next conversation with Brandon and Cindy from Broadway for Racial Justice. Um, so I'm really happy to hear you talk about that. I, I, I think we're gonna dig into that more. Um, Jeffrey, where can people learn more about you? Where can they go to, you know, to, to just, you know, understand you more and what you stand for? Yeah, so jeffreyomura.com has the, the full platform, including a, a pretty comprehensive arts and culture recovery plan. Um, I, I've talked to all the all the stakeholders in the industry um, to brainstorm as many ideas as we can. This, this is just a part. There are many, many more. Uh, but go to the website, jeffreyomura.com. Um, we, we would really love some donations right now. We've got a, a, a filing deadline tomorrow night at midnight. Uh, and so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a big one. Yeah. We need, we need donations. Um, we also need help with volunteers. I keep saying we're going to win this race by having more conversations with more voters than any other candidate. And we need help doing that. We have, we have a pretty great team, but we need, we need more. We need to keep it growing. So how can someone volunteer and what are they volunteering for? What does so, that look like? Yeah. So right now we're out in the streets. Uh, collecting okay. signatures for the ballot petitions. Uh, mm -hmm. Officially, we need to collect 270, 270 signatures. Our plan mm -hmm. is, is to turn in at least three times that many just to be safe. Okay. Uh, but it's it's a lot of, uh, you know, we, we need a lot of help to do that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we're also having text banking and phone banking sessions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, uh, Celia was was very generous with her time, and she hosted a, oh, yes. a meet a meet and greet for us, uh, and it introduced the many of her friends to the campaign. Uh, you know, things like that are are a huge help. It's and because we're all just sitting at home on Zoom all day, uh, it's pretty it's pretty easy to do. Yeah. Um, well, this is all fantastic. I thank you both so much for being here. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to add before? Yeah, you want, one one other thing. Um, I feel like not enough people got to see your performance in Meteor Shower. I'm so glad we got there. I'm really. <laughs> this is the important work that you're doing. Wait, but you how can I vote for you more than one? <laughs> I am um, telling you, this you, was Jeffrey. one of the best performances on Broadway that year. Jeffrey. It was one of the best plays on Broadway that it was only yeah. open for a few months, right? And then and then it disappeared. It was always meant to be that. I think anytime there's like big movie stars involved, they're like, yeah. I will do eight performances. And then it's like done. <laughs> so, you know, if Amy Schumer and Keegan-Michael Key, we were only ever meant to go for like, I think it was five or six months. Right. Thank you. Right. And you're, and you're up there with, with, the two of them, these you know, all-star comedians, and you're yes, there stealing, stealing every what? scene that you're in. Come it was on. my my mouth was open for for ninety minutes straight. <laughs> That's really kind of you to say. I really appreciate it. I really miss that show. I really miss all shows, and I'm really grateful to you <laughs> for all that you're doing. And Celia, as always, I'm grateful to you, and I love you. And it's been such an honor to have you here, Jeffrey. Everybody. Head to jeffreyomora.com to learn more, see how you can um, dedicate your time. We really, we we need him and we need to get our stages back. Uh, Jeffrey, I wish you much success. Sounds like you have to offer, especially understanding the importance of the arts. Yes. Oh, thank, thank you, Susan. Susan. Really appreciate that. Thank you both so much for being here and have a of great course. rest of your night. Thanks, you Laura. Too. Thanks, Celia. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye, you guys. Bye, you guys. I keep doing it. Bye, y'all. I keep using this gendered language, and it's a really tricky thing as a very, very old woman to um, let go of. It's something I'm really working on. My daughter's great at it because we had like a conversation about why we don't say it, and now she corrects me, which is really great. Um, I know that it looks like I'm I'm not looking at the person, but I am. It's just that I wish you could see my configuration. It's very um, shoddy work that I'm doing over here, um, but I, I, I'm I sorry if I look cross-eyed. Um, so our next guests are Brandon Michael Nace and Cindy Tai um, from Broadway for Racial Justice. Before I bring them on, I'm gonna quick um, read for you their mission statement. They're fighting for racial justice and equity by providing immediate resources, assistance, and amplification for Black, Indigenous, people of color in the Broadway and theatrical community at large. So please welcome the founder and executive director of Broadway for Racial Justice, Brandon Michael Nace, and one of the board of um, one of the people on the board of directors, Cindy Tai. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Of course. <laughs> um, okay. This seems like a very obvious question, but I am no Oprah Winfrey. So <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm, so my I'm, best. I'm so glad you said that because I was going to be like, Laura, I hope you were like fully <laughs> ready to channel like the best Oprah you have. No, <laughs> I'm, I, she's, she's queen and I just worship at her feet. But can you explain why you felt the need to, to form this organization? Yeah, I can, you know, it, um, I was actually, I came into this career later in my life acting. I was a, an educator in, in the public school system. So I got my undergrad in music education and then I taught and I actually left education because of my own experiences of racial trauma. I was called the N word by another teacher. Um, and a Where? lot of things and what in state? Texas. Oh, yeah, in Texas. Okay. And and there were just so many things that happened, and it was just like, yeah, I need to. I'm I'm gonna I'm going to do what I always wanted to do, which was perform. But mm-hmm. I grew up I grew up pretty poor, and and I was like, I need to have something that I know I can get a job. So that's why I I I, I was like, I can be a teacher, and I like teaching. Mm-hmm. And then I came into the theater. You know, I I went to grad school at NYU. 
got my master's and in between my two years of grad school, I did late, my first professional gig was Les Mis at the Dallas Theater Center and Liesl Tommy was the director. And it was like a completely different, I'd done the show before like at my community theater, but it was like completely different. Our Jean Valjean was Indian, our Fontaine was black, our Cosette was Asian, our um, Eponine was Latinx. It was just like, it looked like the world. Mm -hmm. And we were doing the show during the Ferguson riots and mm -hmm. Lisa was like, you know, what we're doing, what we are doing in this show is what's happening in Ferguson. This is revolution. Mm -hmm. um, what what the story we're telling is right now. It's literally happening right now. And that moment for sure changed me um, mm -hmm. working with a woman of color who just like embodied strength and just stood in who she was for me to look mm -hmm. up to that and be like, oh, I want to be able to do that. And so then I finished my last year of grad school and then went into the theater industry and was like, think <laughs> so this isn't how we did it when I did this show with Liesl. This isn't the space, the same time. I, I wasn't. And I just mm -hmm. was like, oh, this industry is, is really truly no different than me leaving education. It doesn't matter where I go. I'm going to most likely experience racial trauma. Mm. And... So from the time I graduated, I mean, it's like, you know, I could I could run through the list of like, well, this show, this happened, this show, this happened, this right. show, this happened. So I had always said, you know, we need somebody to advocate for us. We need, we need mm -hmm. somebody, we need an organization, you know, the theater community is so inclusive for everyone. Truly, it felt like except us, except for, mm -hmm. for me, except for black people, except for people mm -hmm. of color in general. And, and George Floyd happened last year. And I looked around and I think it was that there was like a weird limbo where everybody was really frustrated because the theater community wasn't saying anything like theaters mm -hmm. or shows weren't posting anything or saying anything. And mm -hmm. it was in that moment that I was like, okay, well, mm -hmm. I don't have a platform. I don't have a Broadway credit. I, people don't really know who I am, but at the end of the day, somebody's got to like stand up and say like, this isn't right. This is not, this is unacceptable and we have to move forward in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately what I, I, what I did and felt needed to be done. Yeah. Now, thank you for that. Now, Cindy, yeah. you are in a different place in your life. You are in school now, mm -hmm. um, sort of entering into this industry. Yeah. Can you speak to your experience in, in the institution that you're in right now and, and your experience and then also maybe a little bit about CR Truths? Yeah, of course. I, well, so yeah, I'm Cindy Tsai. I'm part of the board of directors at Broadway for Racial Justice. And um, I currently attend Pace University in the musical theater program right now. Um, and it's much like the rest of the world is reckoning with this fight of, you know, truly, it has never been okay. It has never been um, equitable, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we're finally like calling attention to it. Um, and it is strange being like, you know, I'm like a 21 year old and like, I kind of only really um, started doing this work a couple years ago. Um, so I feel very, I, I tell Brandon all the time, I have like imposter syndrome about mm. my activist work or like, you know, do I have a place to speak um, within the industry? I feel like I'm not even like, in the industry yet, um, things like that. And I think like Brandon says it so well, is like the, the people who need to be heard the most are usually the people who aren't even in the room. Mm -hmm. um, like ha haven't even gotten the chance to like be in the room yet. And yes. I feel like students specifically are just, <laughs> they are the future. So like mm -hmm. the people that are in these collegiate programs eventually will become the people that shape the industry. And so I think it's like imperative to care about um, the, the students in these training programs um, because that that's exactly who you're gonna be working with, uh, who the, the next generation is. So CR Truths is a community-led organization. Um, it's created by PACE uh, alums and current students. And we share our individual and collective truths about 
the traumas that we faced in school, mm -hmm. specifically in like BFA theater programs mm -hmm. and performing arts programs in, in college. And yeah, I just implore everybody to check it out and <laughs> check out See Our Truths. There are a lot of um, really necessary stories that are being told there um, mm -hmm. and to just support because this, this fight is the same fight um, that Broadway for Racial Justice is fighting. It's the same mm -hmm. fight that we're fighting with for Black Lives Matter. It's the same fight that we're fighting with for Stop a API Hate. It's the same thing. So um, you just gotta support. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Cindy, do you ever have? Do you ever worry as as like a, a young person and a young artist entering into this? Um, you know, this community, do you, do you ever fear like blowback or do you fear, do you have any fear around it? Oh yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah. The time. Have you had any, have you experienced it? I've, I've definitely experienced it within my program. So like yeah. when I, when I speak up about something like, Oh, actually this thing in the classroom that you said was wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I experience retribution in different ways, whether it's mm -hmm. like, maybe I, I got bad mouth to a, a professional in the industry. And then I think like, oh no, my career is over. And like, mm -hmm. it sort of like, that is the thing is fear is meant to silence people. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I'm not going to lie. It, it's hard sometimes, especially being a, a young activist. Cause I'm not only an activist, I'm also a performer and I want yeah. a career and I want to be able to, to do everything and to do both pretty much. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm not going to compromise one for the other. So I'm not going to like compromise my place as an activist just because I want to succeed in acting or mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely fear is on the table, but it, it's not going to stop me. <laughs> I love hearing that. Yeah. Brandon, you know, that speaks to my larger question. What would you say to people who are afraid of what you um, might represent? to them and what do you think they're afraid of well the the what i would the what i would say to some to that is i would ask why are you afraid that's my first mm -hmm. thing i want to know like and and truly to anybody mm -hmm. anybody out there that's listening that's like well mm -hmm. i'm a little fearful like please sound up in the comments and let mm -hmm. us hear it like i am completely open to that i my hmm, what i would guess is that BFRJ exists in a space in which, you know, and I think it's really great that Cindy is the person who is representing like from BFRJ on the board of directors, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people on the board of directors with Broadway credits who are involved mm -hmm. in other organizations. And um, we have people on our advisory board that are Tony award winners and, and et yeah. cetera. And we value, and we are always constant, we're constantly saying like, what are the voices that we don't hear in our mm -hmm. space? So if we're in a board meeting, what's the voice that's missing and how can we bring that in? And whenever we brought Cindy into to the board of directors, that was it. It was like, we need to hear from someone younger. We need to hear from somebody. We want. We have not a non-equity member on our board, but we want another one. And we need to hear from another people group, um, mm -hmm. another ethnic racial background. And th that's always the way that BFRJ is operating is to... Mm -hmm to look at the way things are normally done and to say, we're probably going to do it the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. um, whatever it is to say like, well, this is how it's been done. We're like, right, we're going to do it way different than that. Mm -hmm. Because we, everything that's been done su thus far has brought us to where we are. And I think we all can say that we are not in a necessarily good place. Mm -hmm. um, the way that the business is operating, et cetera, et cetera. And I think I, People from the outside looking in, to me, it's not. I think people would say like, oh, Brandon's radical. Brandon has radical mm -hmm. views. Mm -hmm. um, when people, just recently on Twitter, somebody was like, you know, um, what like, what are we going to do? How are we going to open? And somebody had responded and it was like, well, like, what do you want, want us to do? Like, we have to do profit and we have to do it. And I was like, well, I think what we need to do is producers, artistic directors, we need to look into their finances. And if they have enough to survive for a year, maybe they need to forego their salaries for a year as we get the business up and running. Mm -hmm. These, these individuals who have made a lot of money mm -hmm. as opposed to the individuals who currently aren't working and are drowning. Mm. To me, it's not rocket science to say like, if we have people in the business who have made a lot of money over the years 
and are losing money currently, but they're still living in their house. There's no worry of that. They're eating every meal. They're shopping mm -hmm. there. And there are people who don't know how they're going to pay their bills. There's mm -hmm. no question to me as to what needs to happen. When we mm -hmm. start up, that needs to be addressed. It needs to be looked mm -hmm. at. And so I think in me saying that, I'm sure a lot of people are like, oh, how dare you? How could you? How, how, how? That's so socialism. That's so this, that's so this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm also just like, um, when it comes down to it, I'm just a person that cares about people. Mm -hmm. And if there are people in our community that aren't able to pay their bills, that aren't able to mm -hmm. sleep at night from stress because they don't know what mm -hmm. they're going to do the next day, how they're going to pay for their rent. And mm -hmm. there are people in our community who have beyond means to, to be on survive, but to thrive during a global pandemic, then those people need to say, you know what? I need to take a step back and say like, while we're all getting back on their feet, I don't need to be taking my my piece of this, my chunk of this, my chunk of this. I need to actually not and leave it so that the rest can like eat and mm -hmm. and and get nourishment mm -hmm. um, from this time of an immense lack of nourishment. Mm -hmm. So I think that BFRJ probably looks radical in the way we do things. I'm very vocal in the sense that you know BFRJ was founded on a foundation of anti-racism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, outside of white supremacy mm -hmm. by black indigenous and people of color mm -hmm. who are constantly looking inside themselves and saying like, okay, how have I upheld this system of white supremacy? Mm -hmm. um, I, as a black person trying to survive in a white world, know that there are times when I'm going to have to compromise mm -hmm. for my survival. And mm -hmm. so I want to be able to clock and look internally and know when I'm doing that so that I can actually break that down and not do that any longer. Mm -hmm. I, I think even saying that to some seems radical. And I'm like, mm -hmm. to me, it just seems like I just want to continue to grow as a human being mm -hmm. to be able to, to care for the human beings that are around me. Mm -hmm. Wow. I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> no, I, I, Good. I mean, that's why you're here. If you came on and were just like staring at me, I'd be pretty, pretty upset about it. I want to ask you, oh, I'm sorry, Cindy, please go I, ahead. I was going to say like, I, I get the same treatment a lot. And even as like a young person, even within my peers, like I, I get treated very rad, like I'm so radical, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know why it seems so radical to just want, <laughs> to just want like, you know, the same education as my white peers or like the same mm -hmm. opportunities as my white colleagues. Um, mm -hmm. Like, why is that such a radical idea? And what I realize, and like, I've been ruminating over this question of just like, what are people actually afraid of? Mm -hmm. um, and it's like they're actually afraid of things changing, like things yes. looking, things looking drastically different. Um, mm -hmm. And that is obviously my hope. It's like these things have to completely change, flip on its head, like, you mm -hmm. know, out the window, new book, open it up. Um, because it's not we've done the Band-Aid. We've done the like, mm -hmm. OK, let's hire a BIPOC person to come in mm -hmm. and like consult us for a few months on our anti-racism. And then, you know, mm -hmm. they're just like an outside source or um you know mm -hmm. let's just hire a couple actors and like make it look like our cast is diverse or and you know mm -hmm. any of these things it's like no we need like a huge structural change and i think that is what people are afraid of because mm -hmm. then they will be entering back into an industry where they are no longer familiar with what mm -hmm. is going to happen um and i think like it's what we're encountering in a, in a lot of different um, there are so many examples that I could pull right now, specifically at Pace. It's like, you know, there are some faculty that are just are not here anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so like, what's next? You know, like it, you know, it looks so different. Is the program even still the program? Like, I don't know. I look at what's happening with the Bachelor franchise, how like everything is being turned on its head. Um, the Bachelor franchise? Wait, like the TV show, The Bachelor? Show. <laughs> what's happening there? There, there. There's, you know, tons of allegations of racism and holding up a white supremacist uh, institution of the Bachelor franchise, which yes, is not surprising, right? It's like a con it's a very no. conservative franchise. Um, yeah, and they're being held accountable to the point where like they need to change fundamentally what their system looks like. Right. So I think that that's exactly what it is. People are scared of that. They're like, well, like, what does that even mean? Like, does that mean right. like we can go 
when I go back, I, I, I don't get seen right away or like, I don't, you know, like I don't get mm -hmm. the things that I usually get. Yeah. Um, and I'm like my coming all the way back to like what I think true allyship is. And for like the white folks who are watching, yes. like, I believe that true allyship, obviously it can't be a lip service. It can't be performative. It can't just mm -hmm. be like, well, we're going to release this statement or I'm going to say this thing. I think that white allies have to be willing to, um, to sacrifice something. Mm -hmm. yes. That is what, that is how I view true allyship because mm -hmm. um, with the amount of privilege that white people have, mm -hmm. um, if equality or equity is truly achieved, that feels like oppression to them because it yes. feels like things are being taken away, right? Mm -hmm. When really maybe that is what should happen. You know, we reallocate. Mm -hmm. And then that that's when people look at me and they're like, you're so radical, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's my two cents on that. <laughs> I think, I also think that it's, it's hard because I think, you, you know, I'm from the South and therapy was not a thing. And in therapy, you have to like do a lot of self-examination. And so I think a lot of it also is people are very much afraid of, of looking in the, of really looking in the mirror because I think about all the things and I think about the root of what I hope to achieve and what we at BFRJ hope to achieve. And I was raised very Christian and it really is like baseline what I was raised at an elementary level. Mm. care for other people, love mm -hmm. other people, take care of other people. And then 2016 happened and all of these people who taught me this were like voting for Trump. And I was like, wait, 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 mm -hmm. You all taught me to care and love other, to care for other people and to love other people. And this man is doing the exact opposite of that, but you're telling me I'm supposed to support him. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, and and what I also want to say is I get it. I'm not denying the fact that it is a scary thing to look in yeah. the mirror and say like, how have I done this mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's a really um, challenging process for any person to look inward and say, what should I be doing that is different from what I'm doing? Like change, I think in any way is absolutely terrifying, but I will say, you know, for like a white woman who has benefited from white privilege and, you know, and in some ways have upheld sort of patriarchal whiteness, it is a scary thing to say like, okay, in what ways have I really contributed in, in a very, um, negative way knowingly or unknowingly and what does it what does it look like to to rip that apart and mm -hmm. then what am i left with mm -hmm. you know yeah. so it's like figuring out i think the scaffolding and that's not your job that's my job you know that's the that's the process that white people are going to have to help each other through because i think that there definitely is this idea of like, okay, I want to be better. So tell me how, and then right. you're doing like the emotional labor. Um, and like you have done enough, you're doing enough. <laughs> um, but I, I do think for people it's, it is scary, you know? And um, I think Cindy, to your point to say, you know, that white people are going to have to, to accept that there's going to be a little bit less for them because they've had the whole pie. Yeah. You know? And so you are right. It's going to feel like some pie is being taken away, but like they shouldn't, we shouldn't have had the whole pie to begin with. But I think that our like nature as people is to like protect the pie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's one thing for me as like, you know, a, a 41 year old woman, you know, to feel like I, feel ready and willing to to like remove myself from situations that would be better held by a person of color but i would imagine as a young person in school entering into this you know new environment that there might be some fear around that you know but musical theater has always looked like this you know it's always looked like this and so it does feel i think to some people somewhat radical to say like, no, it needs to look like the world looks to Brandon's earlier statement. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> I wanted to ask you too, Cindy, do you, do you feel like, you know, obviously you've experienced racism your whole life. Do you feel like it's increased at all during the pandemic? I know anti-Asian racism has, you know, mm -hmm. has really ramped up. Have you experienced it personally? Um, I mean, as much as I can infer, I mean, obviously, I think like back in like January of 2020 before it, you know, like coronavirus was on our minds, but it wasn't like mm -hmm. serious yet. Everyone was still saying it was like the flu. I remember like um, coughing once on the street and like this man like running away from me mm -hmm. or like, you know, me being on the subway and like getting off a subway seat. Um, and the person who was about to take my seat, like had a can of Lysol and like sprayed down the seat right after mm -hmm. I left. Like, yeah. So like, yeah. There's that, you know, and then obviously we see the the huge rise in like actual like physical violence mm -hmm. and um, shunning and verbal violence on mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. um, throughout the in, the entire country and even the UK mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, I mean, obviously, like it's not new. No. <laughs> Asian, Anti-Asian rhetoric and treatment and violence, mm -hmm. it's, it's been here since we came here. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I, and, and I know that, um, mm -hmm. like my, my parents are immigrants, they have experienced their fair share as well. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, it. I think what is different about this year, and there's so much that's different about this past mm -hmm. year, right? And mm -hmm. it's like, first of all, we're all on social media and we all see it and there's mm -hmm. surveillance videos and there's cameras and mm -hmm. um, people use their iPhones to film these things now. And um, I, I still, there is this um, silence around mm -hmm. anti-Asian hate mm -hmm. um, and that just feels, um, it feels generational it feels because of like the history of it um and the history of asian people in this country has been mostly um fulfilling stereotypes or you know like the model minority myth of mm -hmm. being silent or being submissive or being mm -hmm. uh, being quiet or being complacent um especially in the fight uh with other bipocs mm -hmm. so um I think because of that, there's a lot of silence around this, um, even in the Asian community. Mm -hmm. because a lot of people are processing, like, wait, like we, so we don't benefit from the model minority thing. Like that wasn't real. Mm -hmm. Like we, we actually don't have a proximity to whiteness that really, mm -hmm. really benefits us. And we're, we're not white, actually. We're not treated like them. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are get coming to that realization. Mm -hmm. So um, I just urge people to, they like this just has to be talked about it has to be mm -hmm. there has to be something done about it obviously yeah. because this is like hundreds and hundreds of years of in, in the making yeah uh, it, and it shouldn't it shouldn't surprise anybody mm -hmm. <laughs> but right. you no know, this and you know i'll say it I, even if i'm like a broken record i will say like if you are um fighting against asian hate you're also fighting for black lives. You're also mm -hmm. fighting for for any oppressed group, any marginalized group, because um, truly it is the same fight towards liberation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to say to anybody who, you know, made that commitment to anti-racism to mm -hmm. you know, like back in June last year, it's like, now's the time. We mm -hmm. see things happening every single day to black, to brown, to Asian folks. And it's, now's the time to speak on it, to do something about it. Um, and yeah, that's what I gotta say. Yeah. You know, I wanna I wanna circle, first of all, I realize um, audience watching at home that we've had zero performances. Um, this has felt like such an important conversation to me that um, I didn't feel like we needed it. If you are missing and wanting and craving some performances, you can actually go to the YouTube channel for Broadway for Racial Justice. You will see four Fridays worth of performances um, <laughs> from their revival concerts. They are absolutely incredible. You can get yourself there as soon as we're done. Oh my gosh, which is so soon. I can't believe how quickly this has gone, but there are some absolutely incredible performances. Quickly before we go, I, I wanna ask, you know, so what are the immediate resources and the assistance that you talk about in your mission statement? 
So the immediate resources and assistance currently right now, if you are a BIPOC, you could go to our website to fill out a form for emergency financial assistance. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also if you are BIPOC and you are in a theatrical, you work in a theatrical uh, setting, we have a hotline in which you can call to report moments of racial trauma. And you have obviously two ho- two options in that moment, whether you just wanna call in and be like, this is what's going on and I just wanna talk to another person of color, you mm-hmm. will be met on the uh, on the other side of the, the phone by a person of color, mm-hmm. um, a trained advocacy rep who will either be there to just listen and say like, I see you, I hear you, this is awful um, mm-hmm. and affirm you or if your choice is, could you help and advocate for me on my behalf in this situation, we also will serve and step into that space as well as an organization. Those are the immediate resources. Also, we have an engagement team that meets every Friday that is open to BIPOC and white allies. That is just a space to come into community to share, how's your week, what's going on? Um, Hear updates on Broadway for Racial Justice, what we're up to, how you can get involved further. Am I missing anything, Cindy, about immediate active resources? Also, our allied CFRJ yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, is for theatrical institutions to come into an accountability relationship with an outside source, i.e. Broadway for Racial Justice, um, and say, we want to actually open ourselves up to accountability to you, to say, like, we see that you have a hotline. We want uh, our employees, staff, actors to know that that is available to them. Uh, mm-hmm. We see you have emergency assistance. And we also want to open ourselves up that if a moment of racial trauma happens in our institution, at our mm-hmm. theater, at our university, we want you to reach out to us so that we can form community. This isn't a moment of policing. We are anti-policing. Right. It's a moment of forming community to say, like, mm-hmm. how do we come together to learn and unlearn? Brilliant. Mm-hmm. And before we get, we, we say goodbye and are taken out with the melodious tones of I'm every woman, what does true white allyship look like? Because I think that that is a really um, challenging descriptor for people. I think there is a lot of performative activism. You know, it's really difficult to unlearn centering your whiteness. Um, what as succinctly as you can just for my, you know, the white people watching at home, what does true allyship look like? I think, you know, Cindy, Cindy touched on on saying like, yeah. you know, it, it's actionable. And yeah. the things that I have been saying recently, it, you know, I heard a, a, a black female identifying theologian speak at a or speak at a conference and she said, you know, to a room full of white women, you have to divest from whiteness and women started getting up and walking out of the room. But this idea of divesting and investing, where what are you divesting from and what are you investing in? And like, are you divesting from institutions, systems that seek to hold the most marginalized down? Mm. Are you investing in those institutions? Because you need to be divesting from those. Mm. And then what institutions are you investing in? Mm -hmm. Are you giving to your money? (coughs) Excuse me. Are you giving your money, time, resources, thoughts, whatever you can provide to BIPOC led organizations, institutions, Mm -hmm. people? Are you amplifying the work of BIPOC artists? Mm -hmm. Um, Are you producing work that is amplifying the same people over and over again. Mm. And even to say, are you producing work that is amplifying the same BIPOC that you wanna say there is only space for over Mm. and over again? Or are you looking at the people that nobody knows Mm -hmm. that you've never heard of that it's like, oh, these people are incredible. Mariah Little, who you're about to see sing I'm Every Woman. (laughs) I would think that people don't know who Mariah Little is and everyone should know who Mariah Little is. Mm-hmm. I would say also, yeah, just really quickly. Um, yes, please. I think as much time, I think about how much time that Brandon and I spend on <laughs> racism, which is a white problem, right? It's a white yes. problem. And so yeah. I think of like, if I'm spending this much time on it and it's not even my own problem, yes, white people should be spending just as much, if not more time on this. Yes. Um, so, and that doesn't just, it's not only like time and money, it's like thoughts, conversations, the, 
the the way that you talk with your friends, if you bring them up, like that is a way to practice allyship. It's just like completely yes. keeping it on your mind as much as it would be on a BIPOC person's mind every single day. That's yeah. so helpful. Both of those suggestions are so helpful and actionable. I really genuinely appreciate it. And I appreciate you coming on here and, and donating your time. Um, I know that that's, you know, a lot to ask of people right now. Um, but you know, all, you know, everything is going to Broadway, you know, to the Actors Fund, which is keeping so many of us afloat. So thank you for being a part of that. Um, I'm really grateful for what you do. And let's go out on I'm Every Woman, Mariah Little. Yeah. Uh, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> thank y'all so much. Thank, thank you, you, Laura. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Whatever you want, whatever you need, anything that you want done, baby. I'm every woman It's all in me It's all in me Right now, everyone from A to Z.